Uh, my name is Mark Gagan. If you don't know me, I'm the Managing Director of the Insurance Insider. And welcome to our panel, which is titled The InsurTech Revolution. What does it mean for MGAs? Um, I, re I commend you on your good fortune and your presence and your wisdom for coming to this, because I think this panel is bringing together two of the absolute hottest topics that will be running across the, in the Insurance Insider news desk in the last 12 months. I mean, there's probably not another, not a day goes past when we don't write a story about a new MGA being launched. And at the same time, that, on that same day, we'll almost certainly have a story about an insure tech getting funding or launching or, uh, or an incumbent starting up an insure tech fund or something of that nature. So you're, you really are, this is where it's at. So well done. Uh, because of that, we've actually got, we've got quite a lot of time, but I don't, I don't like to go into huge amounts of introductions, but we need to introduce our panel. I don't want to read off... Uh, their CVs, you'll have them all uh, in your um, in your programs or on the website anyway. Um, but we've got a really good lineup, and we've got the good thing is that everybody's got slightly different roles, they've got slightly different day jobs, and I think together we're, we're going to have quite an interesting debate. So let's just get on with it. Um, uh, on the far end here is uh, Graham Elliott, who's the CEO of Azure Underwriting. I suppose Graham's uh, representing the MGA community here today. He's, he's the he's the, he's the home guy. Uh, he's bringing all that MGA, a lot of MGA experience, very long uh, MGA experience, but he's also got the credentials of a West Coast uh, technology insider by way of his association with Bright Talk. Um, and then next we've got um, Alan Thomas, who's a Chief Com Commercial Officer of uh, Simply Business, more of the digital side of things. Uh, Alan, he started his career at RSA, served 12 years at Hiscox uh, before uh, working at Simply Business. And, and I think if you... In case you've been living under a rock for the past year, Simply Business has blazed a pioneering trail in the UK digital dis distribution arena. And in March, uh, a deal for travellers to acquire them uh, was announced. Uh, the consideration was a piffling £400 million, which was three times more than what the previous owner had paid only 12 months previously. So, Touch more than three times. Actually. Touch more than three <laughs> times. Sorry about that. But uh, yes, who's counting after that? Now... On my right, the next on, on, on towards the left of, for you uh, is Chris Lee Smith, uh, Global Head of Alternative Distribution at Argo Global. So I'm sure representatives of uh, incumbent insurers and perhaps nervous uh, representatives of incumbent insurers in the room would appreciate that Chris's day job is simply to make sense of technology on Argo's behalf, uh, which I'm sure many of you in the audience, you're, you're, you're here to do. Um, then next along, uh, another rock star uh, of InsureTech. Um, is Andrew Rear, CEO of Munich Re Digital Partners. Under his direction, Munich Re Digital Partners has backed an amazing variety of emerging household names, if that's the right way of describing it, in, in InsureTech. And these include names that you definitely have heard of, bought by many, Jetty, Sosure, Slice, and Trove. And surely, well, we could quiz him later, but there's surely a pipeline of all sorts of other investments that are imminently about to surface into the marketplace, so uh, we'll, we'll leave that to him. And last but not least, right on the end, is uh, Paolo Cuomo of the Boston Consulting Group. Um, I think in many ways, Paolo is a, a, a resident insurance techie. He's had a, a nearly a decade experience in the London market, uh, marrying insurance and technology. But more importantly, I think more for, for many of us, uh, he's the founder of Intertech London, which is a fantastic community, which has been doing a really, really good job of bringing uh, the insurance and the tech communities together uh, with beer as well involved, which is really, really good. And uh, usually on a sort of Monday evening, once a month, um, I highly recommend you go and check out Instech if you haven't done it all already. It's really, really worth you getting involved. And because of that, actually, I'm, we're going to hand over to Paolo to give us a bit of an overview to sort of set the scene uh, for now. So over to you, Paolo. Thank you, Mark. So um, I'll just do a few slides, and then we'll get into the panel so the, um, the first thing has to be the name. So InsTech, InTech, InsureTech with an E, InsureTech without an E. We have more or less settled as a community on this spelling. And that's important because we wasted most of 2015 working out how to spell it rather than doing anything. And I think being, um, being broadly agreed on that is helpful. And, I mean, very importantly, the point was we, a few of us argued in 2015 about what it meant. And then finally last year, actually, enough people started really engaging with it and what we're seeing here in 2017 and a bit to to mark's point about these events that run on monday evenings or the fact that we've got uh, people sitting on a panel here talking about the topic it's now totally mainstream and and i would totally agree with mark about the point that whether it's 
MGA's one minute or it's InsureTech the next minute. This is absolutely at the front of all of the, the thinking of the clients we're speaking to throughout the market. So um, these graphs here are pur purposefully complicated. Even though InsureTech as a, as a term has only existed for a couple of years, um, the idea of technology and insurance, of course, goes all the way back to sort of original data calculations of life insurance 300 years ago. But um, we have been following technology and insurance companies as they slowly grow to a point now where we've sort of seen 50 billion or so of funding in, um, in these sort of companies. So this is not going away. As a panel, we can talk about a bubble in a minute and whether Simply Business was the first and last that are going to achieve that sort of um, payout. But um, there is a lot of money being spent by a lot of people in this area. Now, what are they doing? A bunch of logos. Most you won't have heard of. Most you won't ever hear of because this is our value chain. In the product development and sales and distribution, these are the companies that are wanting to get the attention, whether it's on the personal line side, selling to individuals, or on the, um, the SME or commercial side. However, as you go down the value chain, most of these companies are providing services into the insurers, into the MGAs, and those are companies that don't need to be known by everyone. They don't need to um, have their brand out there. They need people like Andy and his team investing in them. They need the MGAs to partner with them. They need the incumbent insurers to say, hey, this is an opportunity for us as maybe a relatively slow-moving incumbent to, to get a little bit of a leap on the others by partnering with the startup. And so a whole load of, of names. So it's been a year ago that have been fewer. I'm sure in a year's time there'll be a lot more. Some of them will fall down by the wayside. It's the natural part of things being as new as they are that lots of individuals are going to go out to try things and, and a lot of them will fail. And that's part of the excitement and sort of part of the, the creative destruction that the industry is undergoing. However, it's not just the startups. Here are some of the, the incumbents, as, the, as we're tending to call them, logos. They're, they're not just sitting by. We've heard about um, a couple of things Munich Re are doing, and I'm sure Andy will go into more detail. But Axe is out there investing, running incubators. Alliance can't quite decide, so it seems to have a couple of incubators running. Um, Aviva has a digital garage over in Hoxton where if you go in with a tie, they cut it off and you sit down and you chat with youngsters and chinos about what's going on. Um, the same across Europe. Excel Catlin has a variety of initiatives and then Liberty Mutual and many others in the US. So the incumbents, most of them a couple of years ago, didn't quite get what was going on and there was a little bit of deer in headlights. But by now, everyone's really saying, okay, we either are starting to understand what this means and starting to engage with it, or we don't understand, but we want to start to engage with it. A couple of other logos down here. Startup Bootcamp is an initiative started off in the fintech world, but now moved into the insurance world, and it's just down the, the road here at St. Catherine's Dock. They pick 10 startups every year and incubate them through a process and then help introduce them to the market. And so a number of the, the names that you'll be learning over the next few years have gone through that path. And then B3i is an initiative linked to blockchain. So um, blockchain, of course, was a completely overused term in 2016. Unfortunately, we've calmed down a bit this year and aren't talking about it quite so much. However, behind the scenes, people are getting on working, actually, what can blockchain technology mean for the future of the insurance market? And whilst it, it has gone through a sort of period of hype, I think in the background, it will continue to, to be something of importance for the people who need to care about it. So taking a slight break from the InsureTech side and just looking at um, insurance in London from a different point of view. So this is a slide from the recent London Matters report, which um, the LMG published uh, back in May. And um, it said a couple of things. It said that London, as you can see on the right, is still by far the dominant hub for commercial insurance. It also said that London has broadly kept its share of, um, of the commercial insurance market. But then it said, however, when it comes to emerging markets where we see the growth, yeah, it's not really doing anything much. In the areas that it's strongest, the share, it's the aviation, it's the marine um, and such like markets, the energy markets that are actually the markets that are under the most pressure. So, you know, where, where, where's the good news? And there's a few bits of good news around, for example, what London's achieving on the cyber side. One of the key bits of good news was coming out was the innovation inherent within the, the MGA model, both the growth of the MGA business, but also the fact that MGAs are growing because they're bringing something sort of new to the party, whether it's a smarter distribution or a different approach to the underwriting. So yeah, coming out of that report, that, that was one of the, the positives. And it's worth pointing out down here, one of the, um, the areas under pressure, staff diversity, remains a challenge, clearly very fitting given the um, slightly male, pale, stale board uh, panel we have there. But um, the, the, there's a lot of questions about how this sort of insure tech 
um, trend can also help on the diversity side because we're seeing sort of throughout a, a, a lot of industries the sort of the young energy that's, that's coming through with technology is bringing in a lot more gender balance, um, a lot more sort of nationality balance than maybe we traditionally have in the London market. Um, so just to wrap up, here's a slide showing premium growth is in fact Lloyd's cover holders, but it's a, a, a good proxy. That's going up and obviously you had the charts you saw this morning showing um, how MGA growth is, is going. On the right hand side is a small bit of analysis we did back on some 2015 numbers. These three Chunks here are what we would sort of call the traditional MGA model, be it sort of the, the generous MGAs or the, the specialist. There's a few percent up here, which are the MGAs that are really differentiating through sort of being a tech platform, being an incubator for, for individuals. And I think to, to the theme we're going to talk about now on the panel, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how those, those MGAs who are, are really thinking about how to best use technology and some of the insure tech companies going back to here who are... Um, you know, really trying to work out better ways of serving the market, how those two are going to come together, how they're going to support each other, but also where there's going to be conflict. So hopefully that makes some sense. And now I think we have some questions. Um, well, let's get going. Um, we're here. We've brought together uh, insure techers and MGAs. So how, and, and, and what Paolo showed there, there's a huge, uh, probably the, the majority of the insure tech uh, businesses, or, of startup businesses in the insure tech space, are looking at sales and distribution channels. Um, so they're kind of like MGAs, aren't they? So uh, when I'd, uh, I'll start and, uh, and ask Andrew, how, I mean, how similar are the MGA in the in short tech models and the sort, of, the sort of ones that you've invested in? Um, I mean, we're a business specifically focused on uh, on digital MGAs. Um, uh, so so all all of our insure techs that we're working with are all MGAs in some form or another. Um, I think MGA is a is a broad church. You know, if I think about a traditional MGA, and I, I think about, for example, underwriting expertise, uh, none of our insure tech partners have underwriting expertise. There isn't really an underwriting pen, there's just a machine. So I don't know whether it's on their side or our side, and I don't really care. I mean, it's just a machine. Um, the, uh, but uh, maybe this is more like a, a Venn diagram, I mean, the insure tech space is an awful lot bigger than this. There's lots of interesting things going on in the, uh, in the claim space, for example, in the policy admin space, um, which I'm not directly involved in, but there's certainly, um, uh, there's certainly a lot of activity there. Equally, I think there is a lot of activity in, uh, in if you like, you know, proper grown-up MGA, which is not going to be attacked by InsureTech, at least not for a, for a very, very long time. A lot of what MGAs do is just very difficult compared to what, uh, what InsureTechs are doing. Graham? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a similarity in the two businesses in as much as they're, they're capable of being highly entrepreneurial. And, um, and I certainly think that MGAs that don't think like insure tech companies are going to become uh, very challenged, and I think more quickly than Andy's maybe thinking, because of, of the availability of modern and cheaper and very, um, very deflationary technology out there. But um, I think that the MGA is a great middle vehicle. It sits, it can aggregate capital to give good customer outcomes, it can aggregate capital to give great line size, and it should also be able to use the best-in-class technology tools that are available. I see a lot of a lot of uh, uh, of insure techs solving one particular part of the problem, uh, particular pain points for insurers or for brokers. Um, I think MGAs are in the middle and able to solve a heck of a lot of pain points. And 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 as I reiterate, you know, the strength of us is that we understand insurance. And you know, we were just talking about it. It is it is actually easier for insurance people to get their head around technology than it is for technology to get its head around insurance. Insurance, as it's done at the moment, is incredibly complicated. The data models are not simple. And, and you have to have uh, insurance-educated people to do it. So there's a lot of similarity in the way that they go about it and what they can do. But if you don't engage as an MGA in technology, you're going to be dead. What about this focus on underlying returns? Um, well, you, you, you know, are we a distribution vehicle as an MGA, or are we, a, are we an underwriter? And I think you've got to do both. And I think you can use technology to do both. So, so if, you're, if you're sitting um, um, with some great digital distribution at the front end, but you deliver poor underwriting results, you're going to lose the pen. And so what you have to do is focus on uh, using the technology you've got to get your data into one place. And then you've got to use the la latest t uh, techniques around machine learning, artificial intelligence, to get that data organized and to get your risk selection good. Otherwise, 
you're going to lose the pen, and that's not a good place to be. But I think so. You've got to do both. You can't just be distribution. Yeah, I was asking the questions. We've seen some insure tech models where clearly there's not that foresight or line of sight on getting the underwriting returns right. Which is quite interesting. Andrew's comment about not not necessarily caring who's got control of the machine, but surely there must be, given Munich's for his interest, there must be that interest in how that vehicle is going to make an underwriting return. Yeah, absolutely. I think my uh, the point I was trying to make is to differentiate between, let's say, difficult underwriting problems and simple underwriting problems. You know, if I'm writing um, UK household insurance, for example, I can already build a machine which underwrites UK household insurance by just getting somebody's address and then asking a couple of um, uh, uh, random um, uh, sort of declaration type questions at the end. Now. Um, somebody has to look after that machine and, and we have to make sure that machine is producing the answers where we think it is. But that's a systems testing problem. And eventually, um, whether, that, whether that is implemented on a machine, my side of the firewall or their side of the firewall, actually does matter from a regulatory point of view, but really doesn't matter to me from an underwriting point of view. Um, I, I think there's a big difference between that kind of business and, and the stuff that um, uh, someone like me who is not actually an underwriter wouldn't be allowed to touch in Munich Re because it's actually genuinely difficult. So, so I think the big battleground area is the micro, for distribution, is the micro SME and the SME space, where th that's where all the distri di digital distribution is being created. Uh, and then I think you move further up into the, into the M of the SME and the larger risks, where actually it's smart underwriting and quick underwriting, which is going to win the day from an MGA perspective. So I think there are two different styles, and it's really a question of, I mean, you can do both, um, but actually a lot of people in that list up there are specializing in distribution, or some of them are specializing in smart underwriting or complementary components to the value chain, which are helping, that, uh, helping to kind of reduce costs to do something slightly unique. But, but I think that's how we should think about it. D digital distribution, getting closer to the customer, and then smart and quick underwriting. And, and they're two different market segments. Um, Chris, I would like to just to take on that. When you're out, out doing your day job, do you, are you looking? Are you looking primarily for for a quick and good salesperson, or actually, are you also looking out for for, for a good underwriter? And also, I'd like to ask Alan, as how when you're sitting with your new owner, uh, they, do they see you as a, a really a great salesman, or do they see you as a great underwriter? So, so, so I mean, we're we're looking for both. Um, I, I think uh, you know, organisations that can. Uh, to have something unique about their distribution style and unique about their distribution model that gets them close to the customer, that gets them access to data, um, it is something that will be of, of great value. Um, but also, actually, having smart and capable underwriting on the back of that in the mid-market space is also a big differentiator. So, and, we, and we're interested in both of those models in terms of uh, value that it creates for our organisation. Yes, well, quick sort of hazard warning. We haven't formally completed the deal yet, so obviously we're all very much hoping that does go through. <laughs> um, but yes, our pending new owners, I, I mean, very much think they understand that we'll get distribution for them, and they're very interested, obviously, in how that is going to play out in the US market. But also they've 100% bought into the fact that taking tech and data and using those to gain advantage, not just in the distribution, but also across the full value chain through the underwriting as well, is where you can really make a big difference. So you can use that underwriting, the prowess and the data that you've got, to gain competitive advantage to win customers. Mm. So it's not, I don't think they've just looked at us as a distribution vehicle, it's how to um, do both. Chris, I'm, I'm just interested in you saying that you see a difference, uh, you know, a cutoff point, SME mm. or S and then M and, e, M and large or whatever. And um, surely the techniques that are being put in place by MGAs at the smaller end are valid techniques as you move up the size of, of the chain. And I think they are, but I think it gets to a certain level where the customer is going to require advice from uh, from, from the broker. Mm. So on you know mid-size risks and above, ultimately there will be a broker involved in that. Whereas a lot of these models that we're talking about, I think yeah. you're talking about going directly to the customer itself, um, like your model in uh, mm -hmm. Incentivate. Yeah, we so, go, so we go through brokers. So yeah, yeah so understand. again, yeah. it's sort of uh, they, they sort of vary. So, so a question I think for the panel then, which is that as we move from underwriting to risk management. You know, there's this sort of, right, what we'll be, we'll be doing in 10 or 15 years' time, we'll be helping our clients avoid the risks in the first place. How, how effective is the, is the MGA in that role? Because, you know, the, the, the 
the big insurer sitting behind collating all the data, working out where where sort of the underlying risks are and therefore how to offer almost a, a risk mitigation service. Is that going to be where all the value is in a year or two? I, I personally, sorry, I don't want to be too mad here, but, but I think that the, that the um, we've had 200 years of capital ruling the roost, um, best evidenced by the Lloyds building and everybody going and worshiping at the Temple of Capital. Then we've had a few years of distribution, best evidenced by Aeon's threatening tower sitting above Lloyds and looming over it. We're into an age now of product where the end customer is getting a more bespoke, more personalized, my product, not an insurance product. And the, the age you're describing is service. And that's going to be, that. an MGA is fantastically well placed to do that as long as it's got the technology. It's a, the service-based element is when you bury the insurance in something else that you're doing. And access to the data, I think, was your yeah. point, was it? But to be able to, to really understand where the risk lies, you're going to have to have access to that data. Yeah, so I, I was going to, I, I agree with Graham, but I also, in a sense, disagree. I think they, um, uh, and again, it depends what you're looking at. You're absolutely right. The MGA model, the digital MGA model, is the model that produces uh, that produces high quality services. The model that produces NPS scores that the rest of us lowly insurers can only dream of. Um, but uh, but specifically in the risk mitigation space, um, I, I think that's a very open battleground. I don't believe insurers do have the data. Um, I don't really believe anybody has the data. Insurers can tell you um, uh, can tell you. Uh, which risks are are, are, are are you know are more or less risky, but but frankly a lot of people can do that can do that these days. I met a um, I met a startup uh, data analytics company last week, who who were better at predicting commercial fire incidents than the largest UK fire insurer. Now that kind of thing is quite surprising, and when you see the statistics, you just have to believe it. But if you're looking at specifically at, at at monitoring at you know at the uh, Internet of Things technology, uh, nobody yet has got that, and the uh, uh, the person or company that builds that that monitoring, which means that they have live devices implemented in market and they are collecting the data from that um, uh, from those devices, uh, those will be the winners. And I think that could be the MGAs, it could be the insurers, you know, it might even be one or two reinsurers, or it may equally be. Uh, IoT data providers who set themselves up just as monitoring businesses. I think we're, we're definitely going to pick up and go much deeper into the data question a bit later on. But while we're on this, um, while we're on the sort of MGA and InsureTech question, um, would would the panel think that perhaps at one big difference you're going to be representing a sole source of capital at Simpton Business, or, or not? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No. no. But, but, but with an owner, you might be perceived as being. Yeah, that's no, it's a great question. So I, think, I mean, listen, I think the Travellers guys, when they um, announced the acquisition, were pretty clear on this. They've come out and said they understand that as an incumbent, they are one of the things they can't offer is choice. So they've backed our model of being able to produce choice for the consumer, because that's what we learned in the UK. Customers will buy when they're given a choice of product and um, provider. So I think they've been pretty clear about that. And I suppose but the question would be, do you think the InsureTech model uh, is more likely to end up having being a representative of a sole source of capital, or is that, is that the real difference between a sort of more a big big MGA, big boy MGA, and 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 and, and not being an MGA is 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 that an MGA, more traditional MGA, would represent multiple sources of capital and not. Um, I don't know, Graham. Well, well, you 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 want to be able to trade freely because you want to give the customers what they want. So if you're doing personal lines and you do household and motor and yacht and your capital provider can do household and motor but doesn't want to do yacht, you can't then, by definition, give the customer what they want. So you need to be able to trade freely to give customer solutions. This is all about the end customer. The SCA would be delighted to hear me say this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, and when you're distributing, are you looking for exclusives? I, I think, obviously, in some cases, yes, that makes sense. But in other cases, we accept the fact that, actually, we're going to have to compete with other, with other, with other providers. And... You know, we, we uh, uh, you know, we, we are working actually with Simply Biz on their U.S. operation to actually look to distribute some of our products through their model, knowing that it's a traveler's platform. So I think that's a good illustration of the fact that we're, we're prepared to be looking at alternative forms of distribution. Um, and we accept the fact that we're not the only capital provider in that model. Um, a question here that we've, um, Paolo, um, touched upon. Now... MGAs and InsureTech are very much uh, the order of the day. 
and is either or both uh, in, in a form of a bubble at the moment? And, and if so, how, how might the bubble end? I don't know, Paolo, you, you, you're neutral. We'll put you on the spot. Um, so there's definitely a lot of hype. And obviously there's a difference between sort of getting... There's a difference between... Try this. No. No, keep going. No, keep going. Okay. There's a difference between um, hype sort of going through its traditional cycle and a, and a true bubble where it sort of bursts and a lot of people lose money. Now, inevitably, a lot of the startups are going to fail. That's just natural and that's healthy. And people will lose money as a result. But I, I can't see the, the, the classic sort of billions of, of personal wealth going in, as, as we all learn when we put money in lastminute.com back in 2001 or wherever it was. I don't think we're going to go through that sort of bubble. I think that um, the hype will calm down. There's the traditional thing of we all overestimate change in the short term, but underestimate it in the longer term. And so in a few years' time, there'll be plenty of people saying, oh, I told you so, it wasn't going to make much of a difference. In 10 years' time, we'll all be saying, by gum, I didn't realize it was going to happen that much. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're a bit overhyped at the moment, but we're not going to go through a true bubble burst. And I think, I mean, it's very much on the CEO agenda. Um, I think every CEO, be it, be it broker, be it MGA, be it insurer, um, it's very much on their agenda. And, and they need to be able to answer the exam question, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing in this space? And, and actually, that's important. But, but we need to avoid um, insure tech tourism, mm, where, you know, absolutely. sort of the chief strategy officer gets half a dozen insure tech without ties to come in and present to the board. <laughs> they tick that box and go back to, to the day job. We, we need to avoid that. It's not, not helpful. And, and I think I might, my point being the fact that um, b because, it's, um, because it's, it's, it's so much on the agenda, I think that's creating the bubble itself. Yeah. The, fact that, the fact that everyone has to respond to it is forcing there, there being this response, which is we want to do lots of investments, we want to create labs, we want to do accelerators, we want to do investment vehicles. And everyone's having to respond to that, which is, which is creating this bubble. And, and it would be interesting, though, but there's, in fact, not, not that many startups out there. You know, they, they measure in the hundreds, but when it comes to sort of several hundred insurance companies, each wanting to engage with them, you soon run out. So yes. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know the experience of whether it's a bit of a merry-go-round of the same ones. Yeah. I think you, you've got fear of being disrupted and you've got excess capital both driving a lot of interest in the sector. So you'd suggest there's an element of <coughs> bubble going on. But for me, it's not necessarily different to looking at the insurance cycle on a normal capital basis, when that dries up, some of the better companies are going to really succeed, and some of the ones with less strong propositions are going to fall over. So if that's a bubble, then possibly, but um, I don't see it's massively different to the usual cycle. I think we're in the early stages of it, because um, if, you look at the, if you look at the big names that are getting the big, big numbers, and these guys have done incredibly well, but Lemonade and Trove and companies like that, everybody wants to be there and their bid beyond belief um, to huge valuations. I mean, you've got real revenues and everything, but these, some of these haven't got much revenue yeah. and they're being bid very highly. And then there's a bunch of uh, other insure techs grubbing around trying to raise the money to get going and finding it really quite tough. When you get a bubble, it's when you say, I'm, a, I'm an insure tech company and suddenly says, oh, I have five million. That's a bubble. I don't think we're there now. I think we'll, if, if we get a few more of those troves and other ones, we'll, we'll get into bubble territory, but we're not there yet. Yeah, and we certainly, we certainly see some, uh, let's say, some wannabe entrepreneurs who are, who are trying to ride the bubble. Um, so we see, you know, random, r random companies doing something in data that might become interesting when they figure out what it is, and they attach MGA to their name because they know that's how you get capital these days. Um, but uh, like you said, Graham, we, we generally don't see those guys attracting, attracting stupid capital. There isn't very much really stupid uh, venture capital money mm -hmm. out there still. There is a lot of venture capital money, but most of it's actually quite intelligent. Excellent. Now, um, Graham mentioned about this whole phenomenon perhaps being part of the, the larger difficulty we have in, in the insurance market and the reinsurance market, the global insurance market, with too much capital trying to find its way to risk. We've had this in, uh, with anyway, with the whole model being completely under strain at all different points in the value chain, all the way up to ILS. Uh, so, which bits of this chain do you think, as, as, as perhaps representative, we've got more representatives of, of, of perhaps disruptors in that chain, uh, which bits of it do you think are going to get broken first? I mean, everything's under strain. Which bit's going to go? Well, I think, I think we saw this morning in some of the stats, you're beginning to see that Ollie put up there. You're beginning to see that transition. The, the retail broker in the micro SME and the SME space is under pressure, and the MGAs are beginning to 
um, segment the market even further each time to try and go after particular groups. And that's destroying the, the, the micro SME and the SME broker. So I think that's the, that's the bit of the market that's being under, uh, under strain, certainly in the, in, the, in the next sort of, uh, I'd say the next sort of 18 months to two years. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I think. Sorry, go on. Okay, you go first. I, I was going to say I, I, I agree with that. Our um, uh, our partners who are operating in the micro SME uh, uh, and, and sort of small end of S uh, sector, um, they're seeing behaviour from uh, uh, from their customers which is very similar to personal lines behaviour. So, for example, forty five percent of it of it is is completely on mobile. The entire transaction where even a lot of personal lines are done. Um, whereas, uh, as soon as you move up into the into the sort of mid market sector, um, you have behaviour that is much more like uh, traditional insurance. Uh, it's it's desk based. There's often a broker involved. Even if there isn't a, a broker involved, then it tends to be desk based office hours as opposed to um, mobile ba mobile based on the way home. So that says to me that you can group. Um, micro SME with personal lines and I see no reason why that shouldn't become entirely direct, entirely digital. Um, we're sitting in London, um, we're talking about you know, uh, perhaps so micro, small uh, SME um, insurance brokers perhaps being identified here as being first in the line of fire. So how quickly could do you think, you know, will those desk-based uh, do you, does the panel feel how, how, how quickly do you think um, that disruption will move up through the value chain to the traditional desk based world of the wholesale and special this and the specialty and reinsurance world or, or, uh... so, so I think I think we'll see the creation of trading platforms in that space I think I think some of the larger brokers because they understand the concerns with the way the market's going and also want to reduce their own operating costs I think you'll begin to see broker trading platforms being pulled into that world. And then I think the winners of that become the smart and quick underwriters who can respond quickly to those trading platforms as they get created. So um, I think Ed was in the press recently about their traded uh, wholesale platform. Um, I think you've got um, Aon running their Aon Carry Link platform globally. Um, Marsh are running their platforms. So you'll see a, a bigger increase in these large broker trading platforms, which is going to try and create them. I think the reference this morning was uh, Amazon, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to create their own version of Amazon and their own version of Marketplace. Um, and so that's, I think, where that, that, uh, that's going. If, if I was a 28-year-old trainee reinsurance broker or trainee compliance officer or whatever it might be, I would be genuinely worried about what the, what the job's going to be uh, across that whole sort of middle swathe of um, a sort of white-collar managerial work because uh, the machines are going to take over on, on that front. And then the, the challenge, of course, is how do you train someone to be a senior broker or a senior underwriter if they haven't been a junior one? So it's going to be an interesting few years, I think, as these junior roles just disappear on the basis of, oh, you know, the machine can do it cheaper, so we might as well mm. use a machine. What does that mean for the, the next wave of people? I think if you, to answer the disruption question another way, if you look for where the large amounts, the large pools of money are going in the risk transfer process, and you think that that uh, technology is about discovery of data and, and uh, transparency, it seems logical to me that if it's deflationary, it'll be most deflationary where the biggest pools are. So, so the, the distribution costs, the acquisition costs are very high because of this trend of distribution winning out over capital. That's going to be a, a place to be. But, you, um, but if you're, a, if you're a, um, an underwriter and you're, right, you're underwriting your biggest risks the same way as you're underwriting your smallest risks, you've also got a lot of frictional costs in there that are going to get taken out. And, and also you've got uh, commoditized capital breathing down your neck that doesn't have the expense of a Lloyd's, uh, you know, a load of seats and a load of boxes in Lloyd's. So, so the disruption, I don't think there's anybody can be thinking it's not going to affect me. It's a question of uh, going back to what Pala said about, you know, underestimating or overestimating how much change in the next two years. This is flood water. It's coming up. And it's coming up to a rock near you sometime soon. Um, just a question of when. And, um, and you've got to be, and one, we, we've all got to be ready for it. Um, it's going to be disruptive. Um, in another a secondary question to that is, we've already got an insurance exchange called Lloyds of London. Um, it exists sort of to do a lot of, a lot of that. Uh, it does that in a very analog way at the moment. And 
that there are London market um, initiatives on the way to help bring electronic placing, for example, which is the beginning of electronic trading at least. Um, you talked of uh, the broker platforms being set up, and also we're always writing about uh, insurer platforms for brokers to distribute to brokers. But surely uh, none of those are an exchange, and we have an exchange. Do you think if an ex the London market itself, as the global insurance exchange, is able to um, digitise, does it have a great value proposition in that it's not owned by any single broker, it's not owned by any single carrier? I don't know, I'm just throwing it out to anybody who'd like to... Would you agree or disagree with that question? I, I mean, I think if it can do it, uh, absolutely. I think the challenge is it's, you know, it has obviously had a number of attempts at it. This is a, a new version with a new management and a new leadership team trying, trying to drive it through. I think it absolutely has great value. Um, but but it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing to create. And, you know, history would tell you that it's a, it's, it's a challenge. Um, the market works well when regulation is introduced and regulation forces the market into a different space. Um, it's quite difficult when you're trying to collate and cajole everyone into a new model. Um, and, and that's that's more challenging. But if it can create it, absolutely, there's real value in that. I don't know, think of Beale and the great, 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 great grandson of Edmund Lloyd got you in the elevator up to the 12th floor and did their pitch. Would you invest? Um, I, would, I, would I invest actually is an interesting question. I think that depends on what my investment time horizon is. Um, <laughs> the 326 uh, years. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not out of this. I don't really know the Lloyd's market, so, so maybe this is nonsense. But, but, but I look at uh, electronic trading and I, and I wonder whether there is... Uh, the reason it's never really succeeded is because there's never really enthusiasm for the market because there's never really been a business case because actually this is a market where um, which exists on 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 trust on uh, on line of sight uh, on 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 individuals and the reason it does that is because the problem that the market or those individuals are trying to solve is a relatively difficult problem it's a pro you, you're faced with um, a complex mass of unstructured data, you know, this risk that you're trying to write. And first of all, the broker has to compress that down to a complex mass of at least structured data, right? He has to write a file. And the underwriter isn't going to read that whole file because they haven't really got time, but he's going to read as much of it and he's going to pick through it and try and find the things somehow that are important. And he's going to make a decision. And then so another underwriter is going to follow that decision based on maybe a cursory look at the file, but mostly based on, on the fact that that the guy who signed it is somebody who knows and trusts. And in that market, I, it seems to me that actually a degree of, uh, of, of, of manual uh, intervention is actually important. It's how the market operates. The, the question for me is, in 10 years' time, when, uh, when that, uh, that broker and that underwriter who are compressing structured data into, compressing unstructured data, into a structured answer, which is exactly what machine learning does already better than humans in many, many much more complicated problems than underwriting. When machines are doing that, then I think the market will demand an electronic trading solution because, they, because the idea of doing this manually from one machine, you know, the, the, the broker will be literally taking the output of one machine, giving it to the underwriter who will put it in his machine, which will get the answer, and then he'll walk around the, the market with that machine. And some will say, can't we just connect those with APIs? And bingo, we're done. I still think, though, that um, uh, that's 10 years away, not three years away. I was wondering what anyone else thinks. We've, we've, we've brought up that tough, but has risen, the topic has risen a couple of times about uh, people being made obsolete by machines, whether they're artificially intelligent ones. Uh, there was a good article in the FT the other day about it was the 50th anniversary of the ATM or cash point, the automated teller machine. Uh, and it turns out tellers weren't automated, they just went off to miscell you had PPI instead. <laughs> but, so, but actually, the number of tellers went up. Um, so are we, should, are we wrong to be worrying about the future the, the, of the youth of this industry? That actually, they've got a, do we think they've got a bright future? They've got, they'll be working out other things to do. They won't have to be doing boring things. What I personally don't think you can hide from the truth is there is a lot of wastage. Not a very nice word to describe it, but there's wastage in process and people engaged in doing that, which... Inevitably, the market forces will drive that out. Personally, I don't see that as an awful thing, although it might um, appear at first sight. It should mean that people are able to spend more time doing more interesting tasks. So I can tell you from 
Simply Business has got a stated goal to use technology to reduce the working hours of all of its staff. It doesn't mean we'll be creating as many jobs as we might have done otherwise, but I believe that there's quite a big responsibility there to make sure that when you're bringing in technology to move the business forward, you do it in a way that means that you can treat your people in the right way. And that's the goal for our service centre staff in Northampton to work a four day week off the basis of the tech we'll put over the next three years. So I think inevitably the jobs will be different, but I believe there'll still be a lot of more interesting jobs to do. If, if you've got a marine surveyor with 30 years of experience and he or she can engage with two or three cases a day because half their time spent trying to find the right data or dealing with the paperwork, and you can allow him or her to deal with 15 cases a day because the machine sorts out all the inefficiencies, then that's got to be better for everyone. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that is precisely the point. So, so I, we see that as smart underwriting. You know, the ability to gather information quickly and effectively for an underwriter to be able to then look at the risk and assess it gives them a high level productivity. And we, we think that's where you, you, we really need to be aspiring to be. Um, oh, I was going to say, and, and, and as soon as you're there, You'll look, at, you'll look at that senior underwriter de- dealing with 15 cases and go, couldn't we replace him with a machine? And the answer to that will be yes. That's good. Maybe, maybe that, in that 15 years' time. Well, that's maybe then, not quite your time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is, it raises an interesting point because that's when you do then have choices running business about what you want to do with your business and where you're focused on delivering returns. Is it just to the shareholders or the investors? Mm. Or do you have a responsibility to look after the people in the business? So, Absolutely. Anyway, I've got off my high horse. <laughs> I mean, it's something for all of us to think about anyway, but uh, it's, um, I'll be putting on notice a bit later that I want you all to get it. You're all going to get involved in this discussion, by the way. Uh, it, it's quite a long session, but I don't, I don't want you to, any of you to fall asleep. You have to be paying attention, thinking of lots of questions, by the way, because otherwise, otherwise we'll just get a machine to do it for you. So, so watch out. Um, Something we haven't spoken about yet is um, uh, our experience of insurance and technology, where it's where it's married perhaps most effectively in the UK market. There's been with price comparison, where you know us as consumers will you know type in a few details and we get 57 different quotes you know, within sort of four or five pence apart for our for our home or our motor. Um, so does tech? Does it just mean that everything ends up boiling down to price? Uh, and is that a problem? Uh, no. Abs- I mean, if, if, if we're in that world, then, frankly, we should all stop because it's just commoditized beyond belief. I, I think that the, the point of the data is you can have a keen price, but you can deliver a phenomenal user experience. And if you deliver a phenomenal user experience that gives a high-touch, highly personalized, uh, digitally enhanced uh, feel to the end user that you're speaking directly to them, you're not producing a policy document this thick that gets sent to every single one of your 6,000 policyholders or 600,000 policyholders. If you're sending them their insurances, that's a great use case for technology, and it doesn't have to be done on price then. You'll, you'll have people using you because they like, the, they like the experience. They like the feeling of unwrapping the iPhone and the box sliding out neatly. It's that design that, that is a differentiator, and you can only do that with data, so you don't have to be priced. I, I, yeah, I think... It's, it's all about having informed customers going through journeys that they like and they enjoy. And, 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 and they, they will vote with their feet in terms of which particular model they go through and how they do it. So um, I think, I think you, you can get a much better buying decisions, much better engagement um, through these channels than you can purely through the... Um, uh, and, and price should not be the main driver for this at all. Yes, so th- you know, there's, there's nothing worse than having got the cover and then finding out it doesn't cover you for, for what you're going to need it. So the ability to say, right, you know, here's the, the cheap and nasty one, but this actually based on what we know about you, mm. because of course entering more than a few questions is never going to work. The ability of the technology to know all about you when you're going through the buying decision allows you to be offered a, a better product. And so I think that's a, frankly, it's, a, it's an upsell opportunity. It comes to the, the, the point we haven't really touched on, but you know, where are the the, the premium pool is going because if uh, if everyone's getting safer and therefore in theory the the amount of premium we should be spending it should be going down but actually if we can upsell more to people because we can understand their specific needs then there's all sorts of opportunities. Well, Andy, I think you've spoken quite eloquently about cover and remember there's a, 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 I don't know do do you feel that tech is good enough at explaining to people what coverage they should be getting? Uh, and I feel at the moment, is it good at upselling or is it just good at chiseling 50p or um, something? 
I mean, it it should be good enough. I I, I have to I, I agree with Graham on this. Um, uh, the issue at the moment is the customers have only got so much patience for the awful customer experience that that we put them through. Um, you know, if you go on Confuse dot com, and you know, I I recently bought my bought my son his first car, and I of course went on Confuse dot com, and of course bought the first the cheapest policy I could, and it cost about the same as the car. Um, but but that experience, uh, you know, that Confuse.com experience took me 25 minutes um, to get from, from start to finish. Actually, my wife was sitting with me in the garage buying the car at the time, and she did all of the paperwork and all of the stuff buying the car, including saying no to the 15 extra additional insurance products the, the dealer tried to sell us, while I was still on Confuse.com entering a bunch of basic details. Now, if at that point it had given me five different options for what the cover could have been and tried to explain to me, um, uh, you know, to, is legal expenses insurance important? Is it important to have this excess or that excess? Then I, I, there's just no way I've got the patience for that. Um, but if I can do, one of our partners in the, uh, in the US, uh, you take a photo of your license, and it, it, this works in the US and not in the UK because a lot more information is on your license in the US. But you take a photo of your license and then you're covered. It knows the details of your car. It knows all of the details that it needs to know for motor insurance. And then it can give you a price. Now, if you give me that customer experience and then you say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about some aspects of your cover, then is that worth five minutes of my time? Absolutely. As, as a customer, I would say yes to that. And, uh, and can technology facilitate that to make it uh, easy for me to understand? Absolutely. Uh, and just on, on, on Paolo's point, one of the favorite things that, that I like to say is um, what what price does, what pri pure price competition does to us as insurers is it makes us write interminably long and completely ununderstandable um, uh, policy documents. And it seems to me that that's a really bad place for the industry to get. The, the, uh, the one thing that we are looking at actively at the moment is is uh, chatbots to help explain your policy document with the idea that if a chatbot can't explain what's in your policy document, then it shouldn't be in the policy document. We should pay claims based on what a chatbot can help customers understand, not on what a lawyer says. So, Alan, I don't know. I mean, you know, iPhones are expensive, but people seem to be very happy to buy those. Do you want to sell expensive insurance? Um, so, listen, I've come from... Um, Hiscox simply business. So the value proposition is slightly different, but um, I think what we can't get away from is price is important, a very important part of the purchase. I think you flagged it yourself, Andrew, and said that was your primary goal originally was to get a cheap um, quote because you knew it was going to be expensive. So I think for me, yes, I mean, we do a lot at the moment to represent the value proposition, but definitely over 10 years of operating, um, the team have learned that price is probably the most important factor that's running through the consumer's head. Actually, if you're making it easy and you're making the value proposition strong about what they're going to buy, you can steer them away from it. But it is you've got to be realistic as a provider of insurance that that price is going to be important. So I'd love to say I didn't think it was, but actually all of the research we do with customers and the behaviour that they show us suggests that it is still a driving factor. And they will forego, unfortunately, in some cases, they will forego some cover to um, pay less. And the simplest example I can give of that is... Um, Simply, this is actually kicked off by uncoupling small package policies for small businesses. So all packaged together, just pull out each individual item, and that's what the customer wants to buy is just buy a PL policy. You can now sell it back to them, actually, and you can increase the covers that they buy, but that was the consumer telling us they didn't want a package that the, the industry had created. They just wanted to buy a PL cover. Graham, you got any views on this before we move on? Just to uh, how I said it, you know, uh, it, you know, prices, you've got to be competitive, otherwise you're ripping off the customer. But if you if your aim is to be the cheapest, I think it's not a great place to be. And it doesn't it doesn't give you any margin for differentiation. Uh, and, and, and about the only other thing I'd say is that is that is that the disruption coming from the capital end of things is going to mean mean that those who can put a thin technology layer between the end customer and cheaper capital are going to have an innate massive advantage over everybody else. So maybe it's coming our way from that anyway. But that's kind of the nail on the head, isn't it? If you can be that much cheaper than the competition, you should be comfortable to win on price because you're still going to yeah. carry margin. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, to Graham's opening point on, on, on this about usability, I think it's worth people who, you know, who haven't tried to use the, the Trove app or haven't sort of gone and seen what the interface is with, with Lemonade 
to, to look at it, because whilst you probably don't need rental insurance for an apartment in New York, spending three minutes on, a, on the, the Lemonade site seeing how straightforward they make the process helps you understand what we're saying when we yeah. say a, a more straightforward interaction. We've all experienced the bad side. Most of us haven't seen what good can look like, and we're starting to see players out there who are selling typically not to our demographic, so we might not be bumping into it, but who are actually getting things right, and it's worth learning from that. Um, is a disruptive question because Andy mentioned about um, finding a, an insurtech player that was using Internet of Things or using anyway clever technology to, to find uh, information that a, a really big insurer, a big fire insurer, really ought to have had and to do better than a big fire insurer. So would the question be then if, they, if, 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 some, if an insurtech company can do that, do we need big insurers at all? when we have so much capital and we have means, so much means and so much pressure, that capital is very keen to come and access the risk directly. We have plenty of other people are uh, looking to help that, facilitate that. Do we really need big insurance companies? Yeah. <laughs> Why? I mean, because, you, because you have a promise to pay and innate leverage in the transaction. So a big insurance companies typically, and in Lloyd's, they'll be putting up 60% of their premium as um, as their capital, and they're writing limits, you know, far in excess of that. So that leverage is regulated tightly, and you need grown-ups who can really understand how to do that. And I don't think you can get around that. There's no amount of whizzy, um, you know, 25-year-old technology is going to give you, you know, give you that ability to do it without without really understanding and having some heft behind you, because if you don't pay your claims, you're dead. And this is a promise to pay industry. But if you combine it with the, the right element of the capital market then why can't you have your withy 25-year-old with the data? You can. And then the capital sitting there and everything in between becomes irrelevant. You need big, in, you need, need big pools of capital. Whether you need um, legacy carriers <laughs> with their expensive um, cost bases and also their highly uh, inefficient legacy systems is another matter. But you need large insurers. You need people who can take risk transfer and do it. Yeah, and, and I think maybe that's the, that's the big lesson of the... Of the the evolution that we're now going into, that we need to stop thinking about the market as being as being a broker, NGA, insurer, reinsurer, capital markets, um, but more as, as a, a set of capabilities we need. And one of those is a big, stable, long-term pool of capital, um, which can come from an insurer, it can come from a reinsurer, maybe eventually it'll come from a, from a you know, long-term capital markets instrument. Why, um, why does it need to be big, long-term and stable. I mean, it needs to be able to pay uh, yep. if, when, when one needs a claim, but why does it otherwise need to be big, long-term and stable? Well, it needs, it needs to be big because it's, cause it's got to be able to pay reliably. It needs to be long-term because it's got to last as long as the, uh, as the insurance lasts. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, well, but if these kids have, so that they know what they're doing, but if the kids are already proven that they don't actually know what they're doing, uh, even in a, in a class of business that's been around for 300 years in which they've got all the data and they've got 50% market share, then that, there's certainly something, something to be thinking about there. But um, um, I was thinking, um, the other thing about, this is another a data, we, 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 I said we'd come back to data. Um, we've also mentioned here about lots of really, really smart people finding all the best risks and segmenting them off and giving them a nice discount and giving them a great user experience and whatever else. But what does it mean for the rest of us or for that small rump uh, that is identified as being the unattractive risk? And are we, uh, are we going to get ourselves in trouble? I was wondering if anyone thinks about that or worries about that yeah. uh, as a marketplace. Yeah, no, well, I think it's a great question. I think um, the really interesting bit for me is how you can use some of these tools and techniques and things like machine learning with your data to actually create solutions and ways of getting insurance to those, let's call them less desirable um, segments of your portfolio. So actually, we do spend quite a bit of time thinking about that. I think it's, yes, it's coming. It's coming quite quickly, potentially. But it should represent opportunity. I, I think that that's the point. It should represent an opportunity. I mean, it's a, it's a structural issue. and It's an issue for society. And we were talking to Treasury the other day about, actually, at the end of the day, it's government slash society that needs to deal with people if the insurers don't want to insure them. The insurers are owned by shareholders, their obligation to their shareholders, not 
to the, the individuals in society, um, providing they adhere to all the FCA requirements, etc. But, um, but the point is, if there's a, a group that most people don't want, then surely someone who can understand how to look after that group is going to be able to benefit. So um, the, the, the opportunity as segmentation increases is not just to go after those that look the most exciting, but is also to go after those that, that everyone else is ignoring. Yeah, and I think the um, I, I think that's right. The, there is an argument that sometime sometimes advanced that we should uh, we should be careful and not explore the limits of our data because you get down to uh, insurance of uh, of an individual, and some individuals are, are are simply uninsurable, and that's somehow a bad thing for society. Um, I have a problem with that first, uh, uh, that argument, firstly because actually. Most of what we ensure is random events. You know, even my 19-year-old son is actually statistically relatively unlikely to write his car off and, and, and cost his insurer a million pounds. He's he's statistically a lot more likely than, than than me, and particularly than my wife. But he's still quite unlikely. So there is always randomness. And the other the the other part is that however good we uh, we get at uh, predicting risks. The right answer is never to, to say, oh, well, let's just close our eyes and, and ignore the answer. If we've got a problem in one sector, and I would argue potentially for, for young motors, motorists were, were near in that segment, you know, if we price a bunch of drivers uh, out of the market, we create problems for ourselves. When those, when those drivers can afford to come back into the market, they will be worse drivers and we'll all suffer for that. But then the government should recognize that and, and frankly, what I would do with them, and maybe this is not a popular view in the, in the industry, but I would simply levy the industry for that. If, if we're operating in a market which is creating some social harm at some edge of the market, then, uh, then fix that, create a levy, do, do a flood re type, uh, type solution. We know how to deal with this. And actually, the industry does police itself. If you look at the life insurance side, if you look at what they do with the genetics moratorium on that, that's exactly an example of the industry deciding to, to police itself because otherwise what was going to happen was we were going to, we were, we, the market was going to be regulated to, uh, to avoid that social harm. Right. I'm just looking at my list of questions. I've got thousands more questions, um, uh, which will, but I think most of the really broad, the broad issues I think we have touched upon. Um, so I want to open it up to you in the audience to see if we've got some good questions out there. Uh, please raise your hand and a microphone we brought to you, which I would like you to use and speak clearly into. Here we go. Gentleman over here to start with. Uh, Hugh Bowling. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can we have some discussion of what's going on in the claims space, please? I think Paolo mentioned at the beginning that there's a couple of exciting things. The discussion this morning um, tended towards um, that th th there's no substitute for a real person being at the end of a phone. And from personal experience in the travel world, it's very frustrating when you either can't get the machine or the answer is no, because they won't respond uh, to that. So d discussion on claims, please. What's going on? Well, yes. Interesting. Uh, uh, Lemonade made a huge amount of noise about paying a claim in 0.3 seconds. But of course, that whatever machine did that could also quite clearly have rejected a claim <laughs> in 0.3 seconds and accused the person of fraud, which probably I'm sure the FCA would say that, yes, taking 0.3 seconds to reject a claim is probably not treating your customer as fairly as perhaps you might like to. Anyway, we'll throw that open. Andrew, we'll, we'll start. Um, so, as I say, we are, we are more focused on the on the front end at the moment, um, but we we've certainly observed some of what's going on in claims. Um, I suppose there are um, there are three areas that I see as uh, as interesting. Um, the first is um, uh, you know auto payment or an auto adjudication of of straightforward simple claims. Um, uh, that is coming. That's what Lemonade are doing. You know, these claims they pay out in four seconds. Um, I have no idea what took four seconds. They must have some latency problems in their systems because, <laughs> because this is a very simple question. Uh, simple claims just decided by decided by a machine. Um, we are certainly doing. We're doing some of that. Um, it's a lot easier in some lines than others, but we are. But we're heading there. Um, uh, 
the second area is uh, is fraud and pulling out um, fraud uh, uh, better. Um, uh, this is an area where actually digital is is something of a something of a problem because fraud analytics, uh, voice analytics on fraud is extremely well developed. Um, uh, voice analytics on chat messaging is not very well developed, but there are some people working with it, uh, working on this. We're, we're working with a, uh, a company uh, uh, in Silicon Valley on this, um, and we're their first insurer's use case. Um, their first use case of all was a, uh, a Japanese um, uh, uh, so uh, web, uh, ch sorry, chat-based dating site. And they basically built a system that could tell whether whether she was really into you or or, or always lying on her text messages, um, which I, I have to say uh, I, I've tried it out and it's remarkably accurate. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, the third area uh, and one that I find really really interesting because this is technically a very difficult problem is is the sort of inspection services um, and and often the problem with claims is that there is some physical damage involved. And if you want to assess that electronically, then that means you need you need to get some kind of pictures or video uh, of the uh, uh, of the item being damaged or the damage to your to your house or whatever it is, and then you need somehow to assess that automatically. That is a very very hard problem, um, but we have already seen some um, uh, some experiments in that in that area, mostly around mostly around motor damage. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at uh, the, uh, the machine has a library of uh, pictures of damaged cars and it knows how much the, the repair bill was for that car and then you send it a picture of your damaged car and through machine learning it can figure out what the damage bill should be. And then the machine can say, go off to your repairers and when it gets the bill back, as long as the bill is within its range, it says, okay, then we'll pay. Um, so we are getting there, but these are very... They're all very early experiments, as far as I've seen. They're early, but they're exciting. I mean, that, that example, it's, it's, it's not just that you can see whether or not the, um, what the garage charge built about right, that allows triaging at the, size, at the side of the incident, saying actually that probably needs to go to the garage versus that can be driven home and then fixed on, on the driveway. Um, I think when it comes to, to someone maybe having a, a flood situation at home, the ability now to give some software to someone who's part of the gig economy, on a, a telephone, they can go round, they can do various things, and then they can send most of the data back instead of having to um, organize a three-day wait for um, one of your in-house claims adjusters. On the, the commercial side, there's some very interesting work being done with satellites now that can, um, because most of the world is having satellite images being taken most of the time, you can do a before and after comparison. So when someone makes a claim for silting up in their port after a storm, you can actually go back and you can tell the level of silt that was in the harbour before, compare it to, to after and work out whether actually that's a claimable event or not. You can take a view of, um, there, there was an example recently of some, uh, a claim in, in Libya for some planes that were blown up on a, on a runway. Actually, the before the event imagery showed that some of those planes were already damaged and therefore they weren't covered by the claim, saving millions on the back of a £5,000 satellite photo. I think there's a, there's a whole lot of quite exciting stuff, which, to our earlier discussion, allows expert claims managers to do their job better and quicker, rather than immediately replacing them. But those are all, you know, insurer tools to help. Um, one of the simplest things you could do is to, if you've got the data, is to expose uh, the process to the person who's claiming, so they actually know where they are in the workflow, yeah. and and you know. That's really hard to do unless you've got the right systems. And, and that would be my starter for 10 would be, why not just do that? Why not give the person who's actually claiming um, an alert when something's happened to their claim so they can see it moving through your system and understand what's happening? Yeah, I think that's spot on, actually. I think some of that is exciting. But the, where we are today, customers are telling us that they want to speak to somebody. So we can build them an app or whatever we want to do. But actually, they do want to pick up the phone when they have a claim. And being in control of the claim, or at least feeling like they've got sight of the process, is really important. So giving them access to see where they are in the journey is mm. spot on. So I think it's a classic blending of the getting the customer customer experience through the claim process, working well with the technology, and yeah. just trying to figure out how you maximise that with the use of all the various different technology opportunities that are out there. So that that's going to be the winner. 
So we're quite a long way off. Um, we, you know, we've got delivery um, claims of justice, but we haven't uh, got sort of the claims fixing itself before you get home yet. Next question. Anybody put their hand up? Just following on the claims theme, um, you've been talking about product development at the front end, but actually I would have started at the claims end because that's where you're really touching your customer as an MGA. Um, it'd be interesting to see when you, uh, on the aggregator sites, if you put the uh, ratio that you pay out claims on your per carrier actually with the cheapest and say they paid 50% of the claims, would they actually choose that one or would they go for the one that paid out every time? Just wanted your thoughts on that. Well, it comes, it comes down to the classic, you know, what are, what are people buying for? So, you know, if they're, purely, if they're purely buying their car insurance because the law has told them they have to and they want to adhere, they're not planning on having an accident. They're probably not going to look at that. If you're taking the, um, the father buying for his 19-year-old, he's probably actually thinking about that quite a bit more. So it's going to be driven by customer desire. You have to be very careful with this stuff. We've looked at paying out automatically claims below a certain amount, and we've realized we have to vary that by the day so we don't just get picked off because if you get a name you know for paying out it you're funny if you say i'm pay every claim below eight thousand guess what you'll get a lot of claims below eight thousand quid <laughs> not that people are dishonest it's just that people get you know you know over time you get gained and you get negatively selected against actually but, it's, it's, sorry Chris, there's a few intricacies to it as well i think for me probably the biggest mark of people now and certainly over the next five years is going to be around social proof so it's not just the insurer saying this is our FCA branded how many claims to pay. It's people in their network, people that they know and trust, giving a recommendation about that company. I think that's for us going to be the biggest driver rather than a how many claims to pay. But I was, I was going to sort of reinforce that. That's it's, people will vote with their feet. I mean, if they get a reputation for not paying claims, we all know that people vote with their feet, and this stuff goes around really quickly. So companies can get destroyed very quickly and then lose market share if they if there is a mm. people awareness of the fact that actually they're avoiding claims. So I, I think there's a there's a natural leveller in there somewhere. There's quite an interesting trend going on. If you look at some of the um, advertising the direct line group and some of the other direct players doing at the moment to move away from price and focusing on the claim service, that is quite a new trend and quite refreshing. So I think the more of that we see as well, um, I think that's quite promising. Excellent, right. Another question. Come from behind you, sir. Thank you. I just thought uh, very quickly, it might be worth mentioning that apparently Lemonade have been wiping reviews off their uh, website, bad reviews, uh, some, something about claims not being paid, so it's worth looking into. Um, I just wanted to ask a question um, about insurance as concierge services or risk prevention maybe where in fact the technology is enabling for example a travel insurance policy of uh, uh, your insurer will automatically or the technology will automatically book you onto a new flight or that sort of thing is that perhaps a big growth area for insurance which it's not just cash indemnity you're actually being offered another service or um, some, something else other than the traditional indemnity I, I think that's a, a, it's a great point and I, and I think as people's expectations of what they're purchasing is changing. They're not just expecting they're buying an insurance policy, they're ex actually expecting a series of services that they're buying through this process. Um, and actually just, buy, just buying a single policy is, is probably not where we all want to end up. We probably want to end up with providing a series of services and a series of products into a, into a target segment. Um, and, and that's, I think, a, a further blend as the, as the market and the model moves on. It's not just selling one product, it's selling a series of products and services to that niche group of customers. Um, I, I think that's where we'll end up. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, uh, I think there's a big future in that, kind of, uh, in that kind of product because, you know, eventually the, uh, for, for most customers in most situations, the, the insurance product is actually doing the wrong thing because what you don't want is money. When, you, when your flight's been cancelled, you just want to get on the flight. You don't want someone to give you money. Um, uh, I, I love, for example, one of, one of my favourite old economy examples is, uh, is boiler insurance. You know, how many people have boiler insurance? You know, I can tell you I don't have boiler insurance. I don't need to because mine's covered by British gas. 
And what happens is I pay them some money every month, and if my boiler breaks down, I phone them and then and I, and I call them, and they come around and they fix it for free. Uh, and then, to my horror, I discovered this is actually an insurance product. There's an insurance company <laughs> behind this, but I just thought I was paying money to have British Gas look after my boiler. And uh, wouldn't wouldn't it be wonderful if British Gas could look after your house? You know, if I'd got a leak detector in my house and I've got an electronic door lock, lock attached to my my burglar alarm, then I get a text on my way to work one morning: "Hey, it's British Gas. We've discovered a leak in your house." Um, uh, Bob from British Gas will be will be round between eight and twelve. If you're not in, he'll just let himself in and he'll sort it. And then you get a te text at, at, at one o'clock going, "I've been round. It was very minor. Don't worry. Um, there's a bit of a stain in your carpet, so so maybe you want a claim for that. But it's fixed. You've not come up, come back to a flooded house. Isn't that a fantastic customer proposition? Um, I think you know. I, I use British Gas deliberately because they are the sort of brand that you would allow to come around to your house when you're not in. There are not that many brands that maybe would, that would work for. But but as a proposition that uh, insurance making your life easier rather than insurance paying you money when things go wrong. Um, Absolutely, that surely is the future. Yes, yeah, as long as you're willing to pay for that service, I guess, which not all consumers will be. Yeah, but I wonder what the loss ratio is on my boiler insurance. It's exceptionally good, I'd suggest. So. <laughs> so Do anybody else, any of subscribers to insurance as a new utility? Well, I mean, it's, I, I think it's absolutely the future. Andy's talks are a very good example. We will see that pervasively. We're seeing it in the, the commercial space increasingly as a, as a way to differentiate. And um, you know, linked to the, the earlier point about risk management, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years' time, it'll, it'll all be about stopping it happening in the first place, and then when it does, dealing with it rather than simply handing over a cheque. Mm. Because you know one interesting thing about the, about the stopping it happening in the first place is um, uh, premiums and claims are proportional in our industry. So any technology... Which, uh, which reduces claims will reduce the size of the insurance market and will reduce the size of the profits in the insurance market in the long run. So as an industry, we need to move from being an, from being an industry which, which just pays out when things go wrong to an industry which earns money for preventing things going wrong. Otherwise, our, our, our profit pools, particularly in the commercial sector, uh, will simply decline over the long term. Graham, you got anything to add there? That's why you need uh, technology-enabled cheap MGAs. <laughs> <laughs> right, one more question. If, if, if you don't do it, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But here's a hand. And the microphone's going to come from behind you, sir. There you go. Does the panel think in the future that we will just be acquiring insurance rather than buying it? Did you hear that? Sorry. But it, to clarify that question... Um, so you buy a product, you, so you buy a toaster, you get oh, a just toaster insurance. So to go with the stuff that you buy? Yeah. But, um, Andy, you've got a few, haven't you? You've got a startup that does something like that? Um, we have a few, yeah, and, and, and I don't know is the answer uh, to that, that question. I mean, yeah, I don't know is the answer to most questions about the future, really, but, but this one I, I, I struggle with. I, I certainly see an argument where, where um, uh, insurance just comes as part of a package, um, we have, and we have got some, some propositions, uh, particularly in the sharing economy, where you need insurance to make it work. Um, you know, what one company we're working with is Drover, who's a platform between, uh, between Uber drivers and the, uh, and the fleets that rent Uber drivers' cars. And insurance is needed for both sides of that. So we provide the insurance into the package. Um, I suppose they do know, they could find out if they looked at the small print, but it's not important to them and they don't see the insurance product. Um, uh, there are a lot of people who, who uh, a lot of startups experimenting with sort of location-based insurance. So, you know, laptop insurance that turns on when you leave your house in the morning or travel insurance that turns on when it recognises you're in an airport. Um, I, I'm honestly, I'm not entirely sure about those. Eventually, those still require a customer engagement at some point. They require a customer to think, oh, I need some travel insurance that will turn on every time I go to the airport. And I'm just not sure whether customers will actually think it out that way or whether they will just buy customer insurance along with the holiday like they do now. So um, I just bought a new HP print for £59. And it turns out that I could still buy the 
cartridge, which seems to cost more than the printer does. But actually, I now pay eight pounds a month, and when it gets to a, a certain point, they send me new cartridges a few days ahead. And this struck me as eminently clever, both convenient for me and a, a good revenue stream for them. But what also struck me as odd was that there is no insurance in there. I was still having the, the chat from Curry's PC World trying to persuade me that I needed to buy that from him, and I know the loss ratio, so I, I turned him down. Um, <laughs> But um, yes, you, you, you can imagine that, that surely what you're buying the same way now when you're um, British Airways and you buy a, an engine from Rolls-Royce, you're not buying an engine, you're buying a number of hours that the engine is keeping your plane in the air. That's presumably the way as, as consumers and SMEs we're going to start to, to engage with anything we acquire. Are we going to get, I mean, I don't know, we're just going to end up with thousands. Do you think consumers are going to want to have thousands of insurance policies attaching to every single thing they own, every pair of shoes? No, it's insurance as a service. And, and the deal between Apple and Cisco is an interesting one on, on cyber. Because, you know, you buy, every time you put a new device in your home, you're putting a new um, piece of potential malware in there as well. And, um, and they're going to wrap it all up. And, and I think you're not going to be conscious of the purchase by the end of this. And, and, and that means that the, the, the legacy players are going to find that hard to be in. So, so those mass consumer markets are going to be very challenged by that. But I think insurance as a service is coming, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm totally in the same spot. I think it's just a question of how long it's going to stay together. Okay, I think, um, because I think you've been absolutely fantastic. We had a very long time slot, and I thought a very long time slot after lunch with all these pale men and stale people. It might be quite boring, but I think you've been very... Uh, that's down to uh, the panels we've had today, and, and that's down to the MGA for, for recruiting a fantastic, really knowledgeable panel, which made it very easy to chair because they mostly chair themselves, as you may have noticed. So I don't have to do anything to get. I feel slightly sort of removed by all this not uh, real intelligence, not artificial intelligence around me. Uh, so I'd like you to thank them very, very much uh, by bringing your hands together in the old analog way. <laughs> <laughs>